Cool. Thanks, you guys. So this is uh, this is. I wasn't sure exactly what level to pitch it, so we can skip through some of this stuff. But um, this is uh, some of our initial thoughts, and um, we're in the process of signing the official contracts and all this and that. So we're gonna we're about to go into high gear in in a week or a few weeks here. So um, number next. Uh, this was I don't know if we were sitting around. If you guys are curious, you could click that link and see our lab and see a walkthrough. If you're if we were had some downtime. Guys Send this out to yeah, so you guys have yeah, so this okay. this or if we haven't, I can send it to everybody. I don't know. Did you guys just send it to the folks online? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can send it to everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So just by way of um, introduction, again, I wasn't sure if we were going to just be chatting for a few, so I'll just jam through these really quickly. But I would say that our lab really specializes in new characterizations. So this is uh, last week. I was up in Alaska. This is a rainwater collection, and if you hit the next one, um, these are microplastics coming out of rain. So, um, so we've been doing a lot of work with microplastics. Originally begun with um, some of our work in the coastal zone and in, in, on sandy beaches. And essentially every single place we've looked in the planet we find microplastics. Every single beach around the planet, all the beaches in California we looked at, over a hundred. Um, and we, were, we started with the process of trying to follow these contaminants up the food web to see about human exposure potentially. and. Uh, the crabs on the beach are ingesting these things. The fish that are eating the crabs are ingesting these things, and it's getting super crazy. All of our waterways in Ventura County that we've measured and, and outside of Ventura and Southern California, full of them. So starting just a, a, a sort of on a whim, um, actually it started with our work with these um, small, uh, uh, as you go farther up the food web, the concentration in the guts and tissues uh, gets lower and lower, and so it becomes a bit more of a time uh, time procedure to, to do that at sections and look for these pieces of plastic and we started noticing some contamination in our brand new just built high-tech labs with HEPA filters and all this kind of stuff and long story short we realized we're shedding microplastics inside our new sterile environment because all of the the filters that we use to take out the particulate matter and all that kind of stuff are plastic and um, so then we start now we're monitoring plastics just out in the air ambient air so we have we're doing deployments out on the island and on the mainland and, and um, it, I'll just say there's a lot of plastic in the air and so out of curiosity we wondered hey is it coming out of the rain and it actually is coming out of the rain so this is data from wow. rainwater so all those fluorescent things you see a microfiber there you see particulates we are even getting microbeads which are the machine spheres that normally are sort of a larger particle and heavier but we're getting Air so, or, or rain yes, board. yes, yeah. air and so it's, it's just clearly up in the air mass and it's yeah. getting rained out when it rains. What size are they? Um, so the definition of a um, uh, uh, microplastic is five uh, micrometers and less. So, uh, so yeah, these are these are small things. Um, some of which the bigger ones you can see you can see with your eyes, but. But particularly in the airborne stuff, they're the smaller fraction of the stuff. Point is, um, stuff's everywhere, and it would be great <laughs> eventually if we could also do some. When we talk about particulate matter, um, it'd be interesting to see uh, how much. I know we're using light, and, and we're not doing sort of uh, filter type accumulation, but um, there's some really interesting stuff going on with this. And again, the indoor quality appears to be worse, but the outdoor uh, quality is, is still tainted. Mm -hmm. Um, we use a lot of next slide, pretty please. We use a, do a lot of um, uh, new sensors. Some of the some of which we build, some of which we do other things. And this is just one quick example. Then we'll get back to our topic today. But so this is looking at the little guys on the left. These are snowy plovers. So these are uh, camouflaged sand dwelling birds. And what you're looking at there um, are all the little red circles are a bird. And so that's uh, detected with infrared and visual. We need both. Um, so by combining these sensor data from an aerial platform, we can actually do monitoring that otherwise we couldn't. So we were just talking about being able to go inside a, a private business and do monitoring. Um, in some cases, uh, we don't have those constraints, but we are worried about attracting predators and, and drawing things into these birds. So by using some of more of these remote technologies, we can avoid some of the, the other impacts that would accrue from the actual uh, scientists going out and doing the monitoring. Now we're next. So Thomas Fire, we all know about Thomas Fire. It was, a, it was a pretty crazy burn, pretty intense burn. Number next, um, we our, our back of the envelope calculations are that we emitted something on the order of about 3.6 million tons of CO2 from that one event. This is we're looking at the perimeter of the fire, uh, the burn area of the fire, 
um, and, and the different vegetative communities. A lot of the communities, say like in the hillsides around here, were 90% were or greater in terms of burn. It was, a, it was an incredibly complete burn in many of the uh, ecosystems. Number next. Um, so we do a lot of times monitor, we spend a lot of time monitoring real-time impacts, number next, and um, increasingly are using um, online tools to sort of visualize stuff and collect data. In this case, this is a citizen science sourced mortality observations of, okay. of wildlife from the Thomas fire. Um, this is an old slide, we have more data, but just to show the, the idea. Um, and these apps are really, really easy. We now have these great apps for the air quality, but we can build them for pretty much any data collection okay. effort. So we also do a lot of social science stuff. So it would be interesting, obviously not now, but when, when our, as our project starts to mature, to actually uh, do some type of sentiment analysis and that kind of stuff. Where are people most worried about um, uh, air quality? And then we can compare that to the data and are, are people's perceptions really matching? Or do they have a misread of, of where their risks are, for example? Um, but that's, that's just by way of introduction. Okay, so then what we're gonna be doing is, so this is a seep on the 150, so right here we're, we're on the, or right next to the 150 where, where our offices are here. Um, and this is between uh, where we are located right now in Ojai, and this is a seep, and so what we're looking at, it's a little hard to see with this light, but, Can so. switch off the light? Oh, actually, actually, I mean, you guys get it. We, so, we see it. Yeah. so on the right, that what looks like sort of shiny, that's actually pooled asphaltine, that's, that's uh, tar uh, on the surface, and so, Obviously, we have a lot of naturally occurring seeps, and this was an example of a seep that had caught fire. This is one that um, Ventura, that Cal Fire, the the fire authorities saw and were, and were able to put out. Um, Non-trivial to put these things out. Um, I mean, if they're on the surface, they're relatively easy, but pretty quickly they go subsurface and they have their own fuel and their own oxygen and this and that. So they don't necessarily need to burn at the surface. Putting them out is non-trivial. You need this sort of weird chemical soup. Um, and, uh, and during the Thomas fire, we put out a, an unknown number of these seep fires, many, at least in the order of dozens, um, but uh, we depleted our, the, the county, the, the regional uh, repository of uh, the chemicals that you throw on these guys to put them out, and so they had to order more. It comes from one plant in New Jersey, of course, um, and, uh, and so, so putting them out has been non-trivial. Um, and, and because it required the special tanker chemical stuff, they really only can do it when it's logistically easy to get to. So this here on the 150, very, very easy. They could drive a truck up, apply the chemicals for the duration of time they need to and get it out. But no, I think next slide will show it. So this is a map, this is um, Dogger data, which is our state department that maintains oil and gas uh, lease data. So this is, uh, these are all the reported um, uh, wellheads and, and seeps in our area, which is District 2. Um, and again, the red outline is the outline of the Thomas fire. And so you see a large chunk of, and, and the stuff that's outside the, the I've, we've extracted the stuff that's outside the, the uh, perimeter. So we're only looking at the data that's from within inside, inside. But that's about a quarter of all of the potential surface presentations of, of oil or gas uh, operations or seeps. And so potentially a huge exposure, right? And so, and again, that's why we started this. Um, Kim and Steve and all kinds of folks have reached out to us and said, hey, we have a, next to our house, you know, out off the beaten path, we, we smell oils burning. And they, folks have reached out, called the county, counties come out, stood there, said, yep, that smells like an oil seat burning. And they said, okay, can you do something? And the answer is no, um, for a variety of reasons primarily logistics like you know so again it's it's a very rocky terrain and how do we get there and and everything's already burnt right so from a fire management perspective the the, the risk is there's no real risk of this burning up and then starting another flame so so the answer is primarily been when people have reached out like Meh, you know that's kind of sucks you know but what are you gonna do um, number next and so again we do have this very this especially where the Thomas fire burns very um, challenging terrain here. We're not flat where the fire went. And so getting to these places is difficult. So drones are a perfect tool to, to fly out there. Um, number next. And this, I don't, you guys, you guys can't see it. If, if you guys just have the PDF version, but this is just a, a video. Uh, we did a lot of mapping after the fire. This is just an example. Basically it's drone footage. You can see things. Super exciting. Number next. So this is what we're going to do. So a um, uh, little dark, but um, so this is, uh, we're building some custom units. Thank you, dear. So we're building some custom units. So the main thing over there in the below the response, that's the 
that's the the main drone. And so um, our specialty in our lab is is we build drones. Well, we do a lot of stuff, but in the context of this discussion, we build drones. We also buy commercial units. But our real strength has evolved over the last few years in really buying commercial units and tailoring them. So it's usually not super cost effective for us to build something from scratch. A lot of times the commercial units aren't, um, as they come, aren't necessarily applicable to our monitoring goals. And so what we'll be doing is, is, is configuring a, a sort of a skeleton of, an ex of a um, commercial unit. Uh, and what we're gonna, and so uh, number next I think will show up. So three approaches to, tr and so again, we're looking for these oil and gas seeps and is anything still um, smoldering, et cetera. That picture I showed you before was very easy to see with just a regular you know, iPhone camera or whatever you can take a picture. So that's doing a traditional visual uh, imaging of the, of the landscape or of the area using red, green, blue. And uh, so uh, that's one step. So if we see smoke, clearly there's something burning. Um, increasingly as we go through time, that we're, we're not gonna see that. The next level would be if there's a subsurface fire. So if there's something just within a meter or, or so of the surface, uh, you'll get a heat signature. And so for that, we use a FLIR camera. And the thing that we're gonna use for this project, which is a new cutting edge thing, is the, is the image on the lower right there. So that's a, that's a coupled visual infrared tool that comes from FLIR systems. And so um, very, very accurate, uh, high degree of control of, of thermal uh, uh, condition and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, next is, okay, so, so what if stuff is burning way deep and or there's some anecdotal reports, uh, so for folks that aren't from here, so Ventura County has been, been producing, Southern Santa Barbara, Ventura County have been producing asphalt for a long time, for you know, well over 150 years. Uh, the Chumash, famously, their canoes are designed around the fact that we have ample tar and they, they could make plank canoes and then seal them. So humans have been accessing this, this uh, petrochemical resource for, for quite some time. Um, and so uh, in the early 18, or mid 1800s, people started actively mining this stuff. And so some of it was just dig into the surface and dig down. In some cases though, they did do shafts, mine shafts, like we would do for gold or some, some, you'd get some deep vein or something to start on the surface. And so uh, those don't, were not all recorded. Those were not all uh, located. And there's some worry that if some of those burned, um, the fire could be actually down deep, too deep to see the thermal signature, but yet could be pumping out a bunch of stuff, a bunch of um, uh, PAHs and VOCs and everything. So our third sensor is to is a, essentially a sniffer to see if we can um, uh, confirm uh, VOCs coming off of these areas. So these these data can be used individually or in aggregate. Um, the first uh, and, and so the VOC sensor hopefully will be used even if we find something that is infrared through the thermal or other detection. We can go back and use the um, the VOC to get a sense of what what's the emission rate. And with the drone, we can actually go down low, we can go up in the air, we can look at the decay rate and, and, and uh, all that kind of stuff with the hope of, of ultimately uh, doing a calculation as to how much on a, on a per monthly or per annum basis is, is going into the atmosphere and, and is contributing to air quality degradation in the region. Um, right now, we don't have a good, uh, good estimate of that. Um, number next, so this was, I was gonna talk about purple air, we can skip this because we already just talked about it. Um, I guess get, skip those two ones. So the challenge always comes with this in terms of you know, how do we know what we're measuring or what are we measuring? So number next. So um, there's these ray systems, which I think are now owned by Honeywell, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. So basically these, these are, so this is something that's gonna probably be changing a lot over the next couple months and we'll probably reach out to you guys for expertise. Um, this is really the specialty of my colleague, Dr. Mary Wu, who would have been here, but she had to be in mandatory chemical safety training today, which, you know, the old wow. safety training stuff. But anyway, uh, so she's really our organic chemist. She's really our, our um, volatile organic specialist in our group. But um, essentially, these are handheld units that, and you guys may be familiar with them. They're typically used for, you know, spot detecting, go and see if this, this pipeline is leaking, what have you. And so initially, we haven't had great success in working with the company. What we'd like to do is we'd like to be able to dissect these, these suckers um, and, and better integrate them into our platform so we can get real-time data. But assuming that it's still proprietary and we can't you know, start dissecting these units, at a minimum, we're gonna, we're gonna essentially strap these things on 
and timestamp them to our, our drone platform so we can do patterns and do flights. We land and we can overlay the data in terms of um, uh, uh, where we were at location X at, at time Y, and we can figure that out. What we'd really like to be able to do, again, this is not initially, but over the long term, we'd like to be able, and another colleague of mine who did his PhD on this topic, um, is to be able to follow plumes. So, um, so the drone itself would fly up, we, we could fly a pattern. When we sense an emission source, um, uh, again, this, is, this would all just be VOC sensors. When it, when it, when it would detect an emission source, it would, it, would, it would start a random walk, and when it found the, the um, gradient, it would actually follow that to the source. Mm -hmm. So that's, that, calculation-wise, that's very easy. Mm -hmm. The implementation is the challenging part, but it's completely, if we have enough time and stuff, and it, it shouldn't be that hard. Chimpanzees, and it's able to right, get right. closer and figure out where that chimpanzee is to get closer. And the idea is that it would do the same thing with plumes. Right. Although the chimpanzee example isn't drones. The chimpanzee example oh. are, are, are sensors like, like the equivalent of the purple air. or. Oh, in our phones. Yeah. So in, in, in this case, they're, they're battery-operated sensors throughout this jungle over several mm. hundreds of miles. Stationary. And they're stationary. So it's doing the computation as to where it's Tracking moving through. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. yeah. But the control technology is, is super simple. You just flip a switch to follow that path, wow. essentially. Okay. So, um, so I don't do that, but my colleagues do, and so it's great. Uh, so... Uh, <laughs> So with these guys, um, these guys come in parts per million uh, sensitivity and parts per billion sensitivity range. Um, these are a, 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 like just like we talked about before. It's a it's a light um, it's a light detection, laser detection, um, photogrammetric type of uh, approach to looking at, at uh, the materials. So um, for example, in, on this particular model, uh, this guy can go over um, th can identify over 350 gases. To be clear, it doesn't it doesn't do 350 gases at once. It's not like some some integrated spec that's going to do everything. It, it, we would dial in whichever particular range, methane or or you know whatever the heck it is, and and so you would set it for that particular uh, uh, energy level. I think the next slide, um, yeah. So there, there's a couple different a couple different versions, um, and there's you know benefits and costs for in terms of accuracy and, and, and all this and that. But they all essentially work the same way. And so again, initially, this is this would just be sort of strapping these guys on and, and flying them, acting using the drone um, as if it was somebody walking up in the air. But the hope is that we can um, better integrate that into the control systems. Number next, and so this is how these guys uh, work. So they they have this photonic detector, and it's 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 it's, it's, it's ionizing the. The compounds and it's it's uh, uh, calculating the size of the molecule at the end. Number next, and so uh, these are some examples of some of the detects and non-detects. Um, and uh, so the calibration of the stuff is is um, fairly straightforward in the lab. And so one of the first things we're going to do is work on um, uh, obviously calibrate in the lab, but then also working out. Um, the calibration on the drone. So one of the issues, so we, we were beginning a project that was very similar to this with a um, pollution detection company out of Westlake. They, um, just as they were starting to send us their sensors and we were starting to fly them, they uh, magically went bankrupt. So, <laughs> so we didn't make a whole lot of progress, but, but we're, we're ready to. Um, one, one of the issues for us is um, with air monitoring, you know, the visual stuff is super simple. The air monitoring is not necessarily super trivial given that we're using blades to move our object through the air and we're moving air. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple different options. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the simplest of which is to um, essentially extend a snorkel, if you will. So either a snorkel above the unit or, or a snorkel below the unit, which would either be deployed or attached after the unit took off. So maybe a meter or two down so, so to minimize some of the prop wash. And, and that's just sort of a trial and error thing with the particular unit um, at the particular thrust um, that we can, uh, that we'll need for the weight of these objects. So some of this needs to come after we have everything assembled and then we sort of tailor the unit to sample air in a way that um, we're not over biasing stuff. So that, that's about all I, I think that's about all I had to say. Um, but uh, essentially what we're gonna do is we are, the first, the first phase of this is to do an extensive survey so we're going to go across the the, the area of the burns. Is this here? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So. Oh, sorry. Sorry. No, it's all good. Thank you. So so it's perfect. I'm done. So so, so the take-home message, the answer is: so we're building these drones that have these uh, multiple sensors to sense 
Um, what uh, what stuff? What oil seeps might still be on fire or smoldering or what have you? And um, uh, using uh, uh, visual sensors, infrared sensors, and volatile organic uh, uh, sensors. Um, and so, what, so the plan that we're going to do is hopefully starting in January, we're going to go out and do an extensive survey across the areas where we um, either have anecdotal evidence that there's stuff burning or where we have mapped uh, seeped structure there. And then hopefully some areas in addition to that to see if there's areas we missed. Relatively intense survey. Um, and that's basically our students going out and flying these things. I should also note that all of our students are um, highly trained. So our students are usually better trained than when we go to these professional workshops. They usually more, have many more thousands of hours of flight time than the supposed instructors. So my students are very safe. We have a, a series of um, uh, protocols that we follow to be safe for people, for wildlife, for all that kind of good stuff. All my, stu all my student pilots are also uh, FAA certified as drone uh, pilots. So. So we, we tick off all the liability insurance concern um, issues. We also, when we fly, we, all, we will also have a dedicated person or persons that will be near these folks. Everybody wears safety vests and we're all highly visible um, to intercept the question people. Because whenever we do this kind of stuff, people always say, what the heck is that? Mm -hmm. And it's great, and we're educators, so we love that. But um, we want the pilots to be focused on the piloting and looking for hazards and this and that. So we have specific people that, um, they're usually our new students that are coming into the lab that you know don't can't quite fly themselves yet, and so those folks are out there helping, assisting. But then they're out there to intercept the public, give them information. They could give them the Seafrog website, they can give them our website, whatever. Talk about the project and have that great engagement, but not pose a hazard to. And just this is Kimberly chiming in, and just so our APCD folks know, as you also talk to the county, and we'll talk about this when I present to the board, Mike. Yeah that CFROG will be coordinating with when your flight plans are so that we can help get that totally. info out to the community totally. in Upper Ohio in totally. advance so everyone will know it's not going to be secret, there's going to be drones flying totally. and, and come out and watch if you want and yeah. talk to the people. And so, yeah. Absolutely. Because Absolutely. you do get paranoid when you see something like that flying around, right? <laughs> yeah. What are they looking yeah. for? Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Old people get paranoid. Young people are like, what's that? But yeah, totally. <laughs> but totally. So anyway, so to, to finish up real quick, so, so we're going to go do a series of extensive flights initially, hopefully starting in January. And so for the first bit here, it's really about uh, going and seeing where there might be a problem. Then the rest of the contract is for every, for twice a year going out and follow. So when we do find, let's say, 10 seeps that are burning, we want to return to those sites uh, you know, on a consistent basis and see are they still emitting, what is their, how much are they emitting, is the fire dampening down, is it, is it getting worse, et cetera. So, um, so that's what we're doing.